we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. Who are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Hello, this is Parsing Immigration Policy. I am your guest host, Jessica Vaughn. I'm Director of Policy Studies at the Center for Immigration Studies. And I'm filling in for Mark Krikorian. So here we are about at the end of the federal fiscal year. And that is another year, another million legal immigrants, roughly. Many, including sanctuary city mayors, are discovering that mass illegal migration is not helping their communities, even as they extol the benefits of legal migration. Congress has been fixated on the border problem, at least Republicans have been, and the Democrats have been fixated on figuring out how to enact a mass amnesty. Few are thinking about how well our legal immigration system is working. One person who is thinking about that is my guest today, Phil Linderman. Phil is a retired career State Department official, now a Center for Immigration Studies board member, an old friend and colleague, and author of a recent piece in the American Conservative called Chain Migration and the Diversity Visa Program, The Worst of Legal Immigration. Hi, Phil. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Jessica. It's a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is ours. So what I'd like you to do is first give our listeners a thumbnail sketch of our legal immigration system. Absolutely. So, you know, at this particular time, we as Americans are also living this through this unprecedented period of mass illegal migration that the Biden administration has unleashed on the country and covering up how our legal immigration system should work. Uh, Partly they're conflating all of this uh, illegal immigration into one big pot, but I think it's important, as you said, to keep our eyes on how the legal immigration system should work. And essentially, as I argue, it's a flawed system, but it brings into the country about 1.1 million legal migrants each year, people who are entitled to a green card when they arrive. And the main engine, the main mechanism of getting those 1.1 million legal migrants is the so-called family reunification process. That is, family members who can come with the original uh, visa recipient, that usually is spouse and minor children, And then plus, after they are established in the United States, and in many cases after they become a naturalized citizen, they can petition for other family members. And these are, for an American citizen, these include the parents of that American citizen. It also includes the siblings and the adult children of that American citizen. Legal permanent residents can also petition for extended family. And they can bring their adult children, and that's the main category that they can bring as well. But what you find in the system is it is not only family reunification, these 700,000 migrants, but it is extended family reunification. And many of us think that it's an obsolete system, that the current immigration crisis that the country is living through will present an opportunity to reexamine all of this. And we can perhaps get consensus on the idea that extended family immigration into the United States is a faulty model that's ready for replacement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so important to point out that, first of all, more than two-thirds of all legal immigration is based on who you're related to, not your skills or your likelihood of succeeding here in the country or even because you are a refugee in need of protection. It's because you have a relative who came earlier. And I think it's also important to point out, as you did, that when 
someone is approved for a green card or an immigrant visa, they get to bring all of their family members at that time, their nuclear family members, their spouse, their kids, or their spouse's kids. Chain migration is really family members who weren't nuclear family members in many cases, but are coming afterwards because our immigration system allows the sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews and grown children who have their own families to also get green cards once the original immigrant becomes a citizen. Or in, as you've said, in the case of green card holders, acquires a spouse later. As I think you put it in your article, these are immigrants reaching back to their home country to increase their family and to add family members. I guess what I'm trying to say is that they bring the family they have when they come on their original visa. This is additional migration. That's right. I mean, as Americans, we need to examine the system which was created. You know, this was engineered, the system in the mid-1960s when the world was considerably different. And if you want to give any sort of credence to the original conception here, maybe they thought that it was necessary to have some sort of motor to continue the immigration. There was a necessity for family members who came from faraway continents to have support from wider family. You can always find different justifications for the system as it is today, but I think there is clarity. There should be clarity in a fair discussion, whether you're an immigration hawk and want to lower the numbers or whether you still want higher numbers, but you want a system that's more rational. The system we have now is based simply on growing family members, and it keeps a process in place that, I argue, reduces the speed by which immigrants can assimilate into the country and to become Americanized and identify with our values and basically cut old ties to the country, which are not really part of the process of becoming an American citizen. But I think this is a, the point. The immigration of a family, the spouse and the minor children, should be part of the immigration process. I mean, I don't think there's any mm-hmm. doubt about yeah. that. Most people support that, I think. Yeah. Makes sense. So we need to focus on, the new, as you said rightly, the nuclear family and leave out elderly parents, in my judgment, because they bring little to the U.S. as potential contributors. We need to exclude adult children who have their own life and are presumably already established in the original country. And we need to include brothers and sisters. If you're a 25-year-old young migrant coming to the United States, why should you be reaching back and petitioning your 40-year-old brother? In the American norm, there's not really the close family partnership there that makes sense. What it does is serve to slow the assimilation process of the original immigrant. Yes, that's a good point. And as I remember years ago, one person involved in this immigration debate, I think he might have been a congressional staffer at the time, saying something to the effect of, we all love our families. I love my sister. I love my husband. But I live with my husband. I don't live with my sister. She has her own life with her husband somewhere else, another state even from where I live. And so it seems quite generous of the United States and maybe seems quite obsolete, to argue that the United States should be offering the opportunity of a green card to people who are more distant relatives, not nuclear family relatives, especially in the context of the very high level of legal immigration that we already have. Absolutely. And in a globalized world, you can make a very good case. I think this question has been examined before that When our system, as it currently does, allows for elderly parents of American citizens to come to the United States, that is not a process that isn't necessarily even in the interest of the elderly parents. The cost of medical care in the United States, all of the cut ties of people who are in that third stage of life, so to speak, to uproot themselves and come to the United States, is a burden. It's a burden on the American medical system which is very costly. It's a burden on the family because inevitably the elderly parents, when they come, they're leaving other family back in their home country. The premise of this system is faulty. 
And the bottom line is when we bring in about 150,000 elderly parents of American citizens, recently naturalized American citizens, we have to integrate them into our own costly process of taking care of the elderly in the United States. Which is already burdened. They, some of them may be productive, but in general, there are some 7 million, by the best data that I could find, 7 million who are 65 or older. It is not a process that is in the national interest, I would argue, of the United States to have these people come and spend their last years in the United States. It's not an inhumane system because in our globalized world, you can certainly reach back to the home country. You can send remittances. You can find family in, your, in the original country to help take care of, of these parents. I believe we should not fall for the argument that we are somehow being pro-family by bringing these elderly parents along with the original immigrants. And the interesting thing about parents is a few years back, I did a report on chain migration and broke down the categories and the trends of admissions in each of the family categories. And there are two types of family migration, family green cards. One are called immediate relatives, and the other are the so-called preference categories, which are numerically limited. The immediate relatives category, which consists of spouses of U.S. citizens and their children and parents of U.S. citizens, is unlimited. There is no waiting list. They are processed very quickly relative to the other types of green card applications. And within those two unlimited categories, the parents category has been growing very, very quickly relative to other kinds, you know, because the preference categories that are limited can't grow. But the parents category gets larger and larger each year. And this is also a chain migration generating category. Because when someone comes here, they become a citizen, they sponsor their parents, the parents come over, then the parents sponsor the other kids. And it goes on, and uh, Princeton University calculated that the average legal immigrant brings over 3.4 additional immigrants through chain migration. And so we get a multiplier effect. And so the more immigrants we admit, when they're allowed to bring their parents, if they're assuming they naturalize, but that's a powerful incentive to naturalize. Maybe not the right one, but it is an incentive. This category of parents really starts to fuel the level of legal immigration. Absolutely. This is, as you described it, the heart and soul of the so-called chain migration, which does not have as its central focus, I would argue, the U.S. national interest. It has you know, arguably from the other side, it is sort of keeping these people together. But how does that further their assimilation? And how does that further bringing to the United States young people who are in their best productive years, who are ready to point. cut their ties with their past country and life? Because when you become a naturalized American citizen, we would hope that your first loyalty is to the United States. I know that can be a complicated question sometimes. But we should do everything possible through our policies that further the idea of assimilation, that further the idea of getting immigrants in their most productive stages of their life, and further the idea that they have one first loyalty, which is to our country. All great points. That's the immigration system that we should aspire to. So how would you fix our current system if Someone gave you the authority to do so. <laughs> well, I'm hoping there are a lot of smart people in Congress working on this, and I know they are at the center. Uh, but I would join probably with them to argue that to the extent that the United States, first premise, to the extent the United States accepts immigrants, that it should be the nuclear family, spouse, mother, father, minor children. And let's define minor children as 18 or under. The current system right. as makes the law it, defines it. <laughs> right. As it is American norm. And uh, exactly right. The current system on the immigration side has 20, you know, up to 21. Yeah, I should say it's uh, typical law would define it as 18. Immigration law is different. Exactly. So that would be the first core idea. You come as a nuclear family and you're going to be immigrants in a new land and you're going to fully engage in the new land in the mental cut and to an extent, the family cut that's necessary 
to make you an American citizen and, and consistent with our values and fully on board. You know, this is the idea, fully on board that you are an American. So this, the, the answer to the question is to the nuclear family. How you select the nuclear family and how you run the numbers up or down are fair questions. I mean, you've worked on this. I know Jessica and others at the center. Options like the RAISE Act, which I believe has been proposed in Congress and is a good model, which accept some level of reunifying the nuclear family, but then bases all the other part of the process and the originating of new immigrants, not on their family ties, but on their skills and their training and their youth and their ability in the English language, American values, et cetera, to measure high on some sort of metric, that's the standard that I think we should build an immigration system around. Whether it brings us two or 300,000 immigrants a year or more, my preference would be, I think the Raise Act idea was to come in around five to 600,000. I think that's a good model around which most of the American public, once we get through this Biden crisis, and they settle back to look at what should immigration be, could probably find as a, as a good fit, mm-hmm. uh, five, five, six hundred thousand. That is about the number that the Jordan Commission on Immigration Reform from the mid-1990s settled on also when it recommended the elimination of the non-nuclear family categories, the so-called family third and family fourth preference. So that would cut out couple hundred thousand, I think, is what, what we've, you know, from the family totals. Right. It could be yearly about a quarter of a million, depending exactly who, how many come in on the F2 preference, I think, which can fluctuate. All these categories can fluctuate, as you know, but that takes off, let's say, a quarter of a million of a yearly extended family-based migration. I think that's the key point. I think we're pro-family in the sense that nuclear family makes all kinds of sense. Yeah, I don't think you'd find much argument with nuclear family immigration yeah. at all. And then the other thing about this, which is interesting to pause on as we navigate through the current system, is that it is a bonanza for lawyers and specialists and advisor. I did some research when I wrote my piece, and the legal profession, I think, admits that it's almost a $10 billion, I think it's $8.5 billion industry, just advising migrant families and others how they can navigate the current system, which is built on all sorts of arbitrary mechanisms. For example, the brother-sister category, which should probably be done away with, is capped at 65,000. Who figured that 65,000 is the right number? These are arbitrary decisions that we have lived with for well over half a century now, and they need to be re-examined. We don't need to make, you know, one thing most Americans would identify in our national life is already so complicated. That to the extent that we can simplify immigration, wouldn't that be a good result for both the immigrants and the receiving country, us? And we would know where people stand. Absolutely. We That's can a do great better. point. I always marveled at the fact that you pretty much have to hire a lawyer to get through our legal immigration system, with few exceptions. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be a straightforward process that any person can figure out just like applying for a driver's license or social security. There shouldn't be this industry of people making money off of this in this way. I know employment immigration is a bit more complicated sometimes, but now there's this other problem with our legal immigration system that is caused by desire for chain migration. And that is that because we have decided or Congress has decided on our behalf that there should be limits on legal immigration. And in each of these preference categories is limited in number, but there are more people in the world who want to take advantage of this opportunity for immigration to the United States than can possibly be accommodated through our system. I mean, essentially, we're offering the opportunity of immigration to more people than we can realistically accommodate. And the law provides for maintaining a waiting list of all the people who qualify based on their family relationship, but can't come because of the numerical limits, primarily. Yeah, isn't that a boneheaded system? (laughs) Uh, It really is. I mean, not to get too wonky on how the system works, because even people who who work at day-to-day professionally find complications here. But, you know, to pick up on your point, essentially, 
people are allowed to file petitions. If you're an American citizen or a legal permanent resident, you can file a petition for some of your family members that are abroad. And this is in view, this takes into account that you don't have an immediate visa opportunity because, as you said, some of these categories are capped with numerical limits. For good reason. For good reason, yeah. Because <laughs> we, we can't have unlimited, at least we don't believe there should be unlimited. Well, language. right. I mean, so you, then you set around the world in motion the expectations for millions of people. I think the last time I looked at the number, it's close to 4 million people in foreign countries who have an expectation in their mind, not a real legal expectation, because they're just on a waiting list, that when their place in line is uh, available, they, get a, they can be processed for a visa. And many of these categories will take many years because they are come from countries that already have a big waiting list, Mexico, Philippines, Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. India. India, where you know, they are the motor countries sending as many immigrants as the system will allow each year and then backing up behind them all the people who want to get in line. That is creating a situation for us that's not positive for the American system because we have people who think that they can immigrate to our country when in reality they may never get a chance because ideally the system's going to change. But even if the system doesn't change, in many cases they will be elderly. Years will have passed thinking that they might have a chance to migrate to the United States. And they may be putting off decisions that they shouldn't be putting off in this expectation. I think it's a cruel joke. It's a, it's a bad system. I mean, whether you, as I say, are an immigration hawk or not, don't you think we can do a better system? The question out there for all you know, fair-minded people is, can't we design a system that is not so freighted with all these different categories, with all this requirement that lawyers help you ma manage your way through the system, and then sending out false hope for people that they may get an immigrant visa when in reality they never will? We can do better. We can, and, and Congress should, and Congress needs to also factor in our existing dysfunctional chain migration-based system when it's considering amnesties, for example, that may offer, you know, we're actually going to get a lot more immigration than the people who get the amnesty because of the chain migration categories that are allowed. So it makes sense to pair the chain migration cutbacks of categories if we're going to talk about increases in any other part of the system. Absolutely. So there's a lot of work to be done here. And unfortunately, where are we in this moment is we are living through an unprecedented illegal migration crisis that has been sparked by an administration that, frankly, doesn't want to follow the law. It wanted, presumably, to run up immigration numbers for whatever its agenda might have been for the purpose of conflating our legal immigration system with an illegal or a de facto quasi-legal, flimsy legal system that they have now imposed that will, at the end of their time, bring uh, several more million people here with little claim to be legally in our country. We need to go back to the drawing board on a number of these questions, but hopefully, as Rahm Emanuel you know, once said, no crisis should go to waste. So those of us who think we can do better, let's focus on rebuilding legal immigration when we get a chance. And that requires our allies in Congress and a lot of the scholars like you, Jessica, who have worked years on these issues, who can bring your expertise in making a better system. We Americans can do better. Absolutely. Well said. I want to turn now to another part of the legal immigration system that you talked about in your article, which is the diversity visa lottery, which is just as expendable as some of these extended family migration categories. Can you explain quickly what the lottery is? So the diversity visa program was enacted, I began in 1990. So like in much of legislation in the Congress, the original architects may have had one idea and then there are unintended, unplanned consequences that kick in. But basically the program allows 50,000 immigrant visas that result in a green card for people around the world who the, the sort of legalistic requirement is, anybody can apply as long as they are not coming from countries in the past five years that have sent more than 50,000 migrants to the United States. So the idea is that countries that send robust high numbers of migrants each year to the United States 
those nationals are not going to be able to qualify for the pool of applicants from which the Department of State can select winners then to finally get to 50,000 visas, immigrant visas around the world. So the idea is this, there was a diversity. So we're getting a diverse range of countries, countries that traditionally don't send that many immigrants to the United States as the pool from which we can draw an additional 50,000 migrants each year. Well, a noble goal of diversity, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, what could go wrong? Well, for those of us who've over the years, and I did in my State Department career, work with this program and, and deal with it in foreign countries where we were processing and screening and evaluating visa applicants, a lot can go wrong. Not surprisingly, when you send out to the world the idea that the United States is giving away 50,000 visas a year, you are going to attract some seedy elements who are going to try to defraud the system, to take advantage of it, to scam and con people around the world who want to take advantage of the system. I mean, there are many, many criminal enterprises that have sprung up around the world not so much designed to defraud U.S. authorities in evaluating a visa applicant, a selected diversity visa winner. They are designed, the scams are designed to defraud their own countrymen, other foreign nationals who want to participate in the system, who pay money to brokers and agents and fall for all kinds of scams that are designed and perpetrated against this would-be immigrant population in the name, you know, ironically, in the name as if they were the U.S. authority itself. This activity happens outside our normal process of actually dealing with the winners. This happens, as I say, scamming the 20 million people. The last numbers I saw, there were 20 million applicants around the world who wrote in asking to be considered for a diversity visa to be picked as a winner. Wow. Does it cost anything to No, to it doesn't play? cost anything to play. Ah. You know, it, in many countries, the mentality is such that they think that they can't just sit down at a computer station. Maybe they don't have that capability, but they think that somehow they have, there's an insider. So they pay fees. They fall for scams. Millions of people have been victimized. The data is incomplete. Over the years, uh, the GAO did a report about 10 years ago and said the State Department needed to be more aggressive in dealing with this scamming. The State Department's answer is essentially like, well, much of this stuff is happening beyond our means. It's just criminals out there fooling the public. But the dilemma in that is that they are fooling the public in the name of a program that is sponsored by the United States of the America. The Diversity Visa Program is a corruption multiplier that happens beyond our immediate ability to deal with it, but it's still happening in our name. We should turn it off for that reason alone. It's yeah. not worth the 50,000 visas it brings to the United States. Yeah, this is just sort of immigration for immigration's sake that is creating all these problems for people. And I've heard some people defend the visa, diversity visa lottery by saying, oh, well, at least in that program, we require people to have a high school education or two years of experience in a job. Okay, so the program does require those uh, conditions that you just mentioned, and uh, it does entitle the winner to bring his or her spouse and their minor children. That's the, the basic model of the, of the program. But the dilemma in it is that this is more satisfying to the romantics in the United States about immigration that think that all the old countries can have a chance to send an immigrant to the United States while they discount the criminality that happens around it. Some of that criminality even comes to the United States directly in the sense that many diversity visa winners, I know this from my own experience, will be manipulated by the forces in their home country. As I say, many of these winners are selected, and all of this is going from the State Department to a visa broker or agent acting on behalf of that person in the winning country. And the winner will be told, you need to put this spouse with you. You've now married this person. These are your children. So the U.S. authorities, the consular authorities who are dealing with this case when it finally comes to them to be adjudicated for a visa, have to determine, are these real relatives? The system, in, at least in my day, did allow for 
a winner to marry after the fact and for that person to be processed. Again, it complicates the system unnecessarily. And more than anything, more than the immigration, go back to my point, Jessica, more than the immigration fraud that hits U.S. authorities when they actually deal with the winners is the phalanx of criminality that's going on with all kinds of scamming and and so forth. In Nigeria, this is like a national industry to uh, scam people in the U.S. diversity visa program. We would be smart to disabuse our romantic notions that we're getting all these happy people who want to come to our country. I mean, they exist for sure. But you can also unleash the chaos that this administration has unleashed by saying our border is open. You know that there is more desire to come to the United States than we can ever absorb. So to what extent can a consular officer actually even check the claims made by a winner when they show up for their appointment, you know, about their high school degree or their relationship or anything? Well, ideally, the U.S. consular and diplomatic team in the field that would be dealing with these applicants would have a good knowledge of local documents. They would have good relations with the authorities in that country that issue birth and marriage certificates. And they would have the ability to do background field investigations. It's rare. It can be done. It's very time and resource intensive. And, uh, you know, they can interview people closely and intensely. All of those tools are used, including, at least in my day, we would use DNA. Because sometimes the scenario is this. You would have uh, corrupt local officials who would issue an authentic birth certificate to someone who was unauthorized to receive it. So the paperwork said that, you know, John was the son of Mary, but you had maybe reason not to believe that John was the son of Mary, and you would do an investigation including DNA. This is part of the tool set consular officials have in the field. The reason that we cannot use it more often to make sure that migrants in all categories who come to us, all visa applicants who come to us, are at least screened and double-checked as much as possible. The reason we're limited in doing that is the vast number of people who we're dealing with in our embassies and consulates abroad. So we're, we're often restricted to making superficial interviews, decisions done and over, and that's all that we can do because resources just don't permit a more thorough investigation. And that's the extent of corruption in just one small part of our legal immigration system. Yeah, I think that the American policymakers would be somewhat shocked. I mean, they know this abstractly, but the level of corruption in many countries that we have to deal with in the immigration process that goes right to the question of the bona fides of documents, someone's married or someone's not married, someone's father, mother, et cetera, the relationships, including sometimes adoption cases. All of this has to be sorted out abroad, and a decision, a real decision has to be made because I never met an American consular officer who didn't want to be fair with the people he or she was dealing with, but they also didn't want to be a doormat. They wanted to make sure that they did verify the bona fides of the case in front of them. It's enormously time-consuming. It requires resources. I think U.S. policymakers need to go back and look at some of the reports, for example, about the diversity visa program, and take into account how difficult it is to deal with these questions in corrupt countries. Well said. So one thing that has struck me while listening to you on this issue of vetting is that there was recently a hearing on Capitol Hill regarding the threat of terrorists coming over our open border and some argument as to whether or not that there really had ever been any terrorists who had crossed the border illegally. And it struck me that There actually have been quite a number of cases of people who have come in through the lottery program or the chain migration programs or both who have committed horrific terrorist attacks, killing numerous people. Just a couple of months ago, a lottery winner by the name of Saipov from Uzbekistan was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences for an attack he committed, you know, took a Home Depot rental truck and tried to kill as many people as possible with it. He practiced. He was defiant even when in custody. 
ISIS was celebrating his act and he said he would do it again. He hung his ISIS flag in his hospital room and in his, I mean, really a a pretty horrific case. And these are people who are coming in through our lottery programs and it's creating new chains of demand for migration to the United States where none existed before. And there are some others. Are you aware of other cases? Well, I I am. There's a diversity visa case in the sense that the original winner that came to the United States then turned back and through chain migration extended family opportunities, petitioned and got successfully got a visa for a young man who turned out to be the December 2017 pipe bomber in a New York subway as a direct example. I mean, you have others there. What is the lesson that we learn from this? We, the lesson is, and you can argue back and forth whether migrants can bring more criminality or less to the United States. I know there's some d- deep debates about that. But the point is, I think, that overarches on this is that if the United States is going to open its borders and accept migrants in large numbers, it needs to make not just routine checks, but very, very thorough investigations with all of its tools to forestall as many, if not all of these cases that come to us. It's not acceptable to say that, well, that's just one migrant who got through and caused grave damage, and that's just the cost of doing business. I mean, some people say that. But my response would be, we can do better. In many cases, we found that uh, identities have been matched through watch listing techniques and so forth, but they were still successful in getting through. There are numerous cases like that. And going back all the way to the 9-11 catastrophe, we saw shortcomings in our visa screening and vetting process. The lesson we've learned in those past 20 years in these cases that you mentioned through chain migration, diversity visa winners, is that we cannot let down the guard. And that to the extent that we have these robust programs, we have to be more than vigilant. We have to use the latest tools and techniques. We have to take the time and effort to screen these applicants because if we don't do it, it doesn't happen at all. And then damages can be inflicted on the American public. Indeed. And every category is a target for terrorists. And we can do better than we have done. And part of that is not overwhelming our capacity to screen. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Phil. This is a very important topic, and uh, we look forward to continuing work on it. Thank you, Jessica, for the invitation. I think it's a great, important topic and appreciate the great work that the center is doing on these questions because now more than ever, they are in the front of our national life. How are we going to deal with them and make a very bad situation better for the future of our country? Before I sign off, I want to flag for you all a new blog on our website that reports on some concerning developments in the state of Utah. It's written by Ron Mortensen, one of our fellows and a Utah native. Mortensen notes that Utah has long had a stealth sanctuary policy, offering driver's licenses since 2005 and providing other benefits to illegal aliens. But in the past, the state, for the most part, has cooperated with ICE on removing criminal aliens. That has now gone by the wayside. Within the last year, the two county sheriffs that ICE had contracted with to house all of its detainees canceled these contracts, leaving ICE high and dry with nowhere in the state to house the criminal aliens who are being processed for removal. Why? The main reason is because the Biden administration has imposed significant new requirements for jails that want to work with ICE. The Office of Immigration Detention Ombudsman. The job of this office is basically to hound these jails, performing endless audits and inspections on everything from food to the library to the cleaning products that the jails use. They meet with detainees and essentially solicit complaints against the jail staff, which, by the way, puts a hold on that alien's removal. Finally, the Utah sheriffs caved in to this harassment, probably thinking that the pro-sanctuary state officials would not complain. But somebody did complain, and it was the local ICE field office director, Mike Bernanke. Bernanke sent a memo to ICE headquarters on May 31st, declaring Utah a sanctuary state. You can find this memo linked on the podcast page or in the blog 
on our website. According to Bernanke, the sheriff's decision caused ICE to have to release 2,820 criminal aliens in the first seven months of the 2023 fiscal year. Most interestingly, Bernanke said that their intelligence indicates that the migrants are spreading the word now that Utah is a sanctuary and that there's little risk of deportation if they go there. This situation raises some interesting questions. First of all, Utah has an anti-sanctuary law that was passed in 2011, and it's a fair question whether the cancellation of the ICE contracts was a violation of that law. More importantly, the pro-enforcement leaders in Utah and Congress should examine the behavior of the ICE Detention Ombudsman's Office to see whether their aggressive oversight is actually undermining ICE's ability to do its job and then consider eliminating these offices, which are all over the country, from ICE's next appropriations. That's it for this week's Parsing Immigration Policy, and I hope you'll tune in next time. Thank you so much. 